Excellent. Well, first of all, I just want to say how honored we are to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And one of the coolest things about this is that there are so many people from the company side here that I've met and worked with before. And I just love that we're all doing this. There's not that many of us in Medicaid innovation, right, on the provider and technology side. And so it's an honor to be with you all today. Um, all right. So 12 minutes, go. So um, zooming out for a second, every community has a safety net, right? And that's an amazing thing. But the problem is need is greater than it's ever been before. And the safety net couldn't magically become bigger or wider overnight. That means it's hard to reach people fast enough, especially people who don't live near or don't have access to the largest resource hubs, especially adolescents. And that's what we're gonna spend a little time talking about today. So at Brave Health, we wanted to ask ourselves a question and see what would happen if we used a new paradigm for community mental health. What would happen if we took the community mental health center model and made it available everywhere to an unlimited amount of people? And there's a way that this became possible very, very recently that wouldn't have been possible before. And that's because if you look at the data and Deloitte did a fantastic study on this, until 2018 or 2019, Medicaid beneficiaries did not have smartphones at the same rate as the adult pop average population in the United States. And now, of course, we know also um, youth power have smartphones at extremely high penetration rates as well. But I think that that data point just tells us something really important that we have an unprecedented opportunity to use technology to reach folks and to deliver care in a way that just wouldn't have been possible even five years ago. And we've seen it in front of our eyes and I know some of the other folks on the call have as well. And so that's exactly what we built. Brave is a national virtual community mental health center and engagement platform. And you're gonna hear me say this maybe a couple of different times, but we firmly believe that you cannot treat who you cannot reach. So one of the first things we have to do is reach individuals and families but we also then want to provide that treatment so that we're not creating care coordination without somewhere to send them, right? So at Brave, we do both. We focus on behavioral health. That's what we do. Um, we treat all kinds of different diagnoses the same way any CMHC would. Totally virtual platform, although we do a ton of work to engage individuals using technology and to support them in adoption of technology, if to the degree that there are barriers there. And we're complexity ready. And what I mean by that is to say that we've really tried to create a virtual clinic model that is scalable, but has those principles of multidisciplinary practice, team treatment and engagement, working with individuals, families, and within the system, not without it, to deliver better and differentiated care. So we do three things within our model. One is treat outpatient psychiatry, therapy, case manager, care navigation. Right now we're ages 13 and up in Florida, 16 and up in 10 other states, and we're moving to 10, ages 10 and up by the end of this year. By the end of this year, we'll also be in 20 states total. The treatment piece is your standard care delivery from community health professionals who've devoted their life to this work over synchronous video primarily. Then we have the engagement piece a ton of outreach and engagement work that's also done through technology. We send over 15,000 text messages a day at Brave, right? So that gives you a sense of the kind of work that we're doing at the scale um, in order to get people into care and help them overcome barriers to engagement, get them focused on what the next steps are and how we can support them in those next steps. Even just simple things like answer questions about medication refills or taking care of sending something to a new pharmacy, right? We're using SMS for a lot of this as well as phone. And we have a 40% access center of paraclinical team members who support this work in addition to our team of 200 clinicians. And then the last piece is integration, right? So we're the behavioral health provider. We are we contract with managed care as a provider, but we also integrate with other providers and other entities in the, you know, in the journey of the patient. So we don't advertise. Actually, our referrals come from health plans, from hospitals, from primary care and pediatricians and, and OBGYNs, doulas, et cetera. And when we do that work, what's really interesting is we can get better outcomes for the individual and just a better experience for them because they feel like the system's working for them rather than fragmented, which can also often feel like it's working against you. So we'll talk a little bit more about how that works as well. So by bringing these two things together, our care and navigation engagement platform, which is again, tech driven and enabled, but has a human component, plus the provision of services, we're able to get fast access and high engagement 
And we do a lot of work focusing on people who fit into one, two, or three of these categories. So it might be somebody with a moderate to severe behavioral health condition, right? Maybe someone who is hospitalized for a psychiatric illness, but maybe there are also some SDOH barriers. Maybe there are tech literacy challenges. We do really, you know, um, our model suits itself really is led up really well to this. We also do a good deal of work with folks with medical complexity, families where, you know, there's, uh, chronic medical condition or physical health condition and they need behavioral health support around that. That's somewhere we can do a lot of great work as well because when you're coordinating and integrating with other provider types, there's leverage there. So what you might imagine, there's a bunch of different um, populations that we can apply the virtual CMHC model to with good success. But when we think about adolescents in particular, this has been something that as we were hearing in that great opening um, from Cindy, it's something that has become so clear to us once the pandemic you know, um, became our new reality that it exacerbated something that was there before, right? And it's, it was really a response um, to requests from health plans. They said, please, can you start to work with younger members because we really need to expand access for them. So that's what we did. And actually in our clinical leadership, who I have my colleague Tracy with here, me, here with me today, um, we have a huge amount of people who are so passionate about this work. So we've been able to somewhat seamlessly launch that practice. I mean, I've been working on that for about two and a half years now. So coming back to how we work within the system. So we're very focused on the idea that Engaging individuals means loops, not lines, right? We're not handing a baton off or receiving a baton, baton handoff and then running away. We actually want a cyclical process or a looping process that lets everybody get the information that they need. So let's call, you know, in a, ta a common use case might be um, a health plan case manager who works with a foster care population, uh, makes a referral to BRAVE. We work with a lot of Medicaid foster care plans, including um, we're a dedicated, like we just were included in RFP in, in Missouri, which was exciting and the health plan won. So we'll be working with them in that manner. Um, let's say the foster care case manager at the health plan makes a referral to BRAVE. We receive that referral. This is all tech enabled. They're making a referral through a platform that we have. We reach out to that family within a day. Usually it's hours. We give them an opportunity to self-schedule. If they don't, we call them. We have a dialogue about what they need to get, do to get going. And that information goes back to that case manager. Hey, we reached you know, Mr. Smith. Um, his daughter is scheduled for tomorrow. Or we reached Mr. Smith and he said, actually, we don't need services anymore. That information is going to go back to the case manager. You can see how powerful this becomes when we have this automated data loop that health plans actually know where, where folks are at every step in the journey. Same thing with hospitals. Um, if a discharge planner refers to us, they get a date and time appointment within two to four hours. And one day post-discharge, we start reaching out to the family. Hey, we are scheduled for tomorrow. Are you ready? You need to reschedule? No problem. We'll talk a little bit more about transitions of care in a moment. And then, then at the end of all of this, we're able to aggregate data and get it back to leadership. This gets results. Really high contact rates, 90% reach rate, two-thirds opt-in to services, and we can really improve health outcomes around readmissions and costs. 90% as high as a 90% reduction in readmission. That's just on the behavioral health side. We're also impacting physical health because we know when we take care of our minds, we're taking care of our bodies. We've seen that we've reduced medical spend by between 16 and 40%. So our impact is, you know, we use a scalable model and it's, that means our impact is broad, deep and scalable. And I wanna call out that about two thirds of our patients are Medicaid beneficiaries today. So this is an area that we've really leaned into um, and continue to make our core focus. And we've also, as I said, built out a practice that specifically serves adolescents and is something that we are going to continue to focus on, especially in, in conjunction with managed care. Um, like I said, we just were in an RFP that won and we're in three more that we think will win. 20% of our patients are what I call super rural, meaning they're in towns of 2,500 people or fewer. This is a natural, it lends itself naturally, right? We're doing this work to help people get over technology barriers. We have technology that's designed to work in low bandwidth environments. There doesn't, doesn't require app download. And so it's been really effective. 21% of our patients are 21 or under. We have a pretty high prevalence of SMI diagnoses coming back to the complexity readiness. And almost two thirds of our providers have an adolescent practice. You can see over here, some of the qualitative feedback from families we've worked with. I love that they call out convenience, right? We know that it can be a big burden on families and caregivers to be bringing their, their, their family members to appointments. You know, they're working, they have other kids, et cetera. And then I also love seeing that 
there's this concept of being able to connect, right? A common misconception is we can't connect with patients in the same way or build a therapeutic alliance in the same way using technology or using telehealth delivery systems. And I don't think that's the case, right? So um, we see in practice so many ways that that's not the truth. And in many ways, I think it can even be more relevant for our adolescent population who's been very used to using technology throughout their lives versus some of our non-digitally native patients. Um, so just to highlight a couple more outcomes, like I was saying, we do a lot of work in transitions of care. We sometimes are able to as much as double seven and 30 day follow up after hospitalization or ED visit for a mental illness. Again, this is through that coordination loop. That's only possible because we both provide the care and we do that engagement component, all of it driven by technology. There are other programs that we've lit, um, that we've rolled out that have driven specific outcomes for given populations. And I wanna to speak to this because I think it's important when we think about specific populations that we tailor what we're doing to them. And so this is an example of a program that we create, created specifically for individuals who had, had historically like low engagement with psychiatric services. And we were able to have over a 25% increase in engagement with psychiatric services once we use solution-focused brief therapy interventions to help engage people in care up front. So these are the kinds of things we can do when we look at a population and say, hey, what do we really need for them? So wrapping it up, I think I have 60 seconds to spare. Brave is a virtual community mental health center. We don't replace the amazing work that happens in communities. We augment it. And it is our job to focus on Medicaid populations and deliver not just powerful outcomes for those who get into care, but engagement for a net new population of people who haven't engaged before. And we're able to bring this solution to people who don't just live near, you know, dense urban centers, but many of whom live in rural areas. And that is a testament to the strides that Medicaid as a whole has made around getting technology to individuals who live in rural communities.